Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Objects That Change the World Lecture Series, organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the Miami University Alumni Association, today we present Icons with Dr. Andrew, Andrew Casper. Andrew Casper is an Associate Professor of Art and Architecture History and a specialist of Renaissance and Baroque art in Southern Europe. He is the author of numerous essays and articles on 16th century icons and religious paintings in Italy, as well as author of two books, Art and the Religious Image in El Greco's Italy, and the forthcoming The Shroud of Turin, an artful relic in Baroque Italy, both published by Penn State University Press. Dr. Casper is also winner of the 2014 Miami University Distinguished Teaching Award. Welcome to Dr. Casper, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, just to let everyone know, questions were collected during registration, and Dr. Casper will attempt to address some of those throughout his webinar presentation today. You'll also have the option to ask questions during the webinar by clicking the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen. Please note that in the interest of time available, we may not get to every question. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including time for those questions and answers. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Casper. Well, thank you for having me. Um, this is uh, an exciting experience to be able to still be able to share my ideas and my research, even in times where it's difficult to do so. Um, so I just have a little blurb to, uh, to read off for you guys regarding this talk. Uh, my talk today is part of the Objects That Changed the World lecture series, which is organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the MU Alumni Association. This online lecture series invites us to contemplate objects that fundamentally reshaped human experience, from concrete and porcelain to the birth control pill and the first blues recording. Each talk explores the history and cultural legacy of a transformative human creation. Sponsored by the Friends of the Miami University Humanities Center, Objects That Change the World aims to celebrate the central role of the humanities in a Miami education and modern society. If you would like to become a friend of the Humanity Center, please consider a donation to the center in any amount. Annual gifts from Friends of the Humanity Center are indispensable to funding our workshops, fellowships, student programs, and alumni outreach efforts. Fulfilling the center's commitment to students, faculty, and the public would not be possible without your help. Please join the generous alumni and friends who have invested in the future of the humanities. Every dollar makes a difference. To learn more about the important work of the Humanities Center at Miami, please go to www.humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. To donate, click on the red box at the bottom of the registration page for this lecture, or go to www.givetomiami.org slash humanities center. Thank you. And without further ado, let's talk about icons. So I actually have four parts to uh, my talk today. One, what is an icon? Two, the living image. Third, destroying images. And fourth, the Shroud of Turin. So I'll be moving more or less sort of throughout these four um, sort of subtopics uh, in the next 40 or so minutes with all of you. And hopefully uh, we'll generate some great questions. I'll be more than happy to spend some time answering and discussing with you um, at the end. So first of all, what is an icon? So this talk is treating icons as a category of images. I'm not treating a single icon. I'm not talking about a particular object, but instead icons as a class or as a category of objects that date all the way back to the early, the earliest centuries of, 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 of Christian history. On the left, you see an icon within an icon. It's an icon of the triumph of orthodoxy, and it pictures the celebration of a particular icon by the Empress Theodora, who is the Empress of, uh, of the Byzantine Empire in the eighth century, in the ninth century, excuse me. Um, and then, of course, a retinue of other uh, holy church figures. And what they're celebrating is the return of the acceptance of icons as a proper way to foster Christian devotion. But what this particular icon doesn't really convey is the idea that it's not really about a single object. And you can see on the right here, I have selected four randomly chosen other icons that repeat 
to a large degree, the style, the composition, and even the subject of that icon within the icon um, on, on, on the left. And if you know anything about Byzantine icons, and don't worry if you don't, um, but if you do know anything, you know that you know the kind of style gets repeated ad nauseum for centuries, that there's kind of a restricted use of the ways in which artists are portraying these holy figures and icons. And as a result, we tend to associate icons with a particular kind of appearance use of gold, flat, you know, or no backgrounds whatsoever, um, you know, sort of stylized striations of the folds of the cloak of the Virgin Mary, for example, you know, very simple, direct frontal portrayals of holy figures. And these are meant to foster worship. You're supposed to actually pray with these icons as an aid. But I'm not really interested in defining icons, however, as a kind of stylistic thing, like something, well, we recognize an icon because they look like the objects that we see here. Instead, I want to think in today's talk about icons in a very wide angle kind of way. And in that regard, I'm going to be looking at icons less as a particular class of objects that are visibly recognizable as objects, or sorry, a uh, class of objects that are visibly recognizable as icons. And instead, I'm going to look at icons as an idea and how that idea of an icon has spread pretty widely even up to the present day with how we conceive of images, how we relate to images, how we think of them as living, why we destroy them, and so on and so forth. So we have to understand that icons begin actually in the Old Testament of the Bible. The Ten Commandments, there's ten of them. One of them addresses the fact that we're not actually supposed to be making images. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything, dot, 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 dot. That is a commandment directly from God, right? God says, don't make images. That is God's domain. He is the divine creator. Moreover, when we make images, we tend to misuse them. So in the Old Testament, there's the fear of idolatry, that you're going to worship an image instead of God. And so that is a seeming prohibition against images. But if you know anything about Christian history, there's lots and lots and lots of Christian images. Why is that? Why is that that there could be a justification for the making of Christian images, even though it does seem to violate this very um, prohibition from the Ten Commandments that says, you shall not make images because we're afraid you're going to treat them like idols. There's two ways in which Christian images and therefore icons generally are justified. And I want to, I'm not going to read through these texts, but I just want to sort of pick apart the, the sort of the main passages in yellow. There's not going to be a lot of reading in this talk, so don't worry. This is one of the few times we'll do it. Um, so St. John of Damascus uh, wrote in the 8th century, the defense of holy images which is one of the first and probably the best known of the uh, Byzantine um, justifications for religious images. And he says in that passage in yellow, he says, well, with images, the honor given to the image passes over to the prototype. So what he's saying basically is that despite the fears of idolatry that occasioned the um, prohibition against making images in the uh, in the Ten Commandments, um, he says, well, you don't have to worry about idolatry because an image is basically just an image. It's empty, it's inert, it's transparent. And when you pray to an image, instead of you praying to the image itself, your prayers actually pass through the image and go straight to the prototype or to the holy figure represented inside of it. Now, a good way of thinking about this is, uh, you know, think about sort of how we right now are conversing and engaging with each other. You are all looking at computer screens, tablets, your phones, what have you. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that nobody in this talk right now believes that I am actually living inside your computer screens, right? Because we understand that the computer is just a technology. Yet it conveys the ability to communicate with the prototype, meaning me, but I don't live in the computer screen. So you're not talking to me, you're talking through the image that conveys my presence to you. It's the same thing. John of Damascus is saying an image is just like your iPhone, okay? It's transparent, it just brings you in communication, but the image itself is just a device. It's empty, it's inert, it's the technology. The most important thing is the person that you are brought into communication with, okay? The second justification for icons is even more straightforward. And it's simply from St. Gregory the Great uh, in this famous passage from uh, one of his letters to a bishop in the, around the year 600. He says, 
For what writing presents to readers, this a picture presents to the unlearned who behold. A picture is instead of reading. So basically the analogy is that a picture is useful because it serves as a surrogate for a text. And so images are not only useful, but actually uh, they're essential for teaching, you know, the stories from the Bible, the teaching theological concepts. And so in addition to the idea of the image as this empty, transparent window or iPhone to the divine figure, it also tells the stories. And most people in the Byzantine era uh, were illiterate. They did had could not access the text, the main texts of, 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 of the Christian religion. So the images stepped in and provided for the ability to learn those stories. So that's the concept of the icon, those two things. The inherent transparency of the image is just a thing that brings you into communication with the divine, but again, not the divine thing itself. And also the fact that we learn from the stories that are told in visual means as opposed to textual means. That's the concept of the icon. By that token, icons are defined by function rather than appearance. So these two images, which you don't have to be an art historian to recognize that they are two totally different styles, two totally different manners of representing holy figures. But functionally, they're both icons. And they don't look much like those icons of the Virgin Mary that I was showing you in the first slide uh, of my talk today. But functionally, they're operating the same way. You can look at, for example, the icon of the crucifixion on the left by Pietro Lorenzetti from the 1340s, and you learn the stories of the crucifixion of Christ. It corresponds very closely um, to how that story is, is told in the Bible. And then with El Greco's, uh, it's not really crucifixion, it's actually a Christ carrying the cross, a little bit of a mislabel there. That's supposed to allow you to bring yourself into direct communication with Christ. You can pray through the image to Christ by virtue of, 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 of the painting that he makes here. It is stylistically very different than the other one, but both hit upon those two features or those two kind of identities about um, icons that allow for Christian images to be made, even though the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so you're with me, right? An icon in this talk, I'm gonna be treating as a concept, a definition, something that um, is useful and functional and not something that we recognize through its sort of stylistic or visible appearances alone. But here's the thing, and this is the crux of the whole history of Christian images. There's the official understanding of icons, but then there's the unofficial understanding of icons. So those theological justifications for icons where the image is just a transparent window to the divine and the image tells the stories in visible means as opposed to textual means. That's the official line, okay? In both cases, icons are not idols, meaning icons are not seen as themselves physically divine objects. They are not themselves like spiritual matter. They do not contain within them the essence or the spirit or the presence of the divine figure. You're not supposed to do that because that would be treating the image as an idol. An idol is a false god. But in the unofficial understanding of icons, it's actually not that clear that people were easily able to make that distinction between the icon as just an image and an icon as the manifestation or the physical spiritual presence of the figure represented inside. And you take a look at these, we can kind of, even from these two uh, uh, examples, you can kind of see why people maybe would have seen icons as somehow more inherently divine, containing a mystical, spiritual, even supernatural presence. The icon of Christ Pantocrator from the sixth century. I mean, there's something about the liveliness of the eyes. The eyes, in fact, are painted very differently, sort of give you that sense of kind of a twinkle, even a slight moving of the eye that on some level might trick us into thinking that the icon is somehow moving, it's living, it's animated. Similarly, this icon of the St. Michael Archangel, which is actually at the Basilica San, uh, San Marco in Venice, uh, one of a number of really important Venetian icons uh, from this medieval period, it's a relief icon, meaning it's actually textured, right? So kind of like the surface of a coin where the facial features and even the uh, encrusted um, uh, clothing of the St. Michael Archangel are raised over the surface. Well, it's gilded, meaning it's metallic. It's, you know, covered in all sorts of precious materials. 
Um, but one thing that this still photograph doesn't convey is the fact that light is gonna dance around this. It would have been illuminated by candles. And when you have a three-dimensional relief, uh, you know, metallic three-dimensional relief at that, or three-dimensional relief at that, and it's illuminated by candles, and you're praying, and your prayers, your whispers, your breath is causing the candle flame to flicker back and forth, the light is gonna dance and dart about this relief icon in various ways. And it too is gonna give you the sensation that it's animated. It might be moving. We might see the expression of Saint, like Mark, Saint Michael Archangel changing right before our very eyes. It's this kind of thing that kind of compels people to look at icons as somehow not just the empty, inert objects that the theologians tell us to believe them, that we actually might in practice regard images in the way we're not supposed to. We regard them as if they are somehow the manifestation or the containers of some sort of living mystical presence themselves. Here's a case in point, one of a number they could have shown you. Um, I know that I have a number of students, both uh, past and present, who are tuning into today's talk, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and any one of those students who has taken my uh, introductory to art history survey knows this altarpiece by Duccio di Buoninsegna from the city of Siena. This is a monumental altarpiece. Um, and I'm less interested in sort of identifying what its main features are. I'm less, I'm more interested in identifying how it was regarded. And this is a foundational object for the history of the early Renaissance and indeed for the history of Christian icons because there's a really important text that talks about how this thing was revered when it was completed. It was commissioned to uh, be the main altarpiece for the cathedral in the city of Siena in Italy. The city of Siena had as its primary patron saint, meaning as the city of Siena's primary protectress, the Virgin Mary. So they believed that they had a special relationship with the Virgin Mary and the Cathedral of Siena was gonna be the main locus for that devotion to the Virgin Mary. And this altarpiece was gonna be within that main locus, the primary means by which people can pray to the Virgin Mary for protection. Well, when Duce de Bonensegna completed this altarpiece, he didn't just install it in the church under the cover of night. It didn't just sort of just appear there. It was paraded through the streets. Let me read this text. We can all read together here as it tells us something very interesting about how this image is regarded. At this time, the altarpiece for the high altar was finished. Now this Our Lady was she who had hearkened to the people of Siena when the Florentines were routed at Monte Aperto. They have a soccer rivalry still today, Florence and Siena. So I always think about this whenever they play. Um, and on the day that it was carried to the Duomo, the shops were shut and the bishop conducted a great and devout company of priests and friars in solemn procession. And they accompanied the said picture up to the Duomo or the cathedral, making the procession around the Campo or the main city square, as is the custom. All the bells ringing joyously out of reverence for so noble a picture as this. And this picture, Duccio di Nicolò, the painter, made. And all that day they stood in prayer with great almsgiving for poor persons, praying God and his mother, who is our advocate, to defend us by their infinite mercy from every adversi adversity and all evil and to keep us safe from the hands of traitors and of the enemies. And so this is interesting because if this is just an image and it's just therefore, you know, the iPhone, so to speak, that brings us into communion, like, you know, the thing you FaceTime on, why is it being paraded through the streets? What does that tell us? Now, I always ask my students, like, is there an equivalent in today's society? And I've been teaching now for about 12 or 13 years at Miami, and almost every semester I teach a class that includes this image. I still have yet to hear a compelling um, idea of what an equivalent case might be. One thing that's usually brought up is victorious sports teams where they win a championship and they come back to their home city and they're often given a parade. I'm thinking of like the U.S. women's national soccer team when they won the World Cup in 2019. There was the ticker tape parade in Manhattan. And it seems to be that they are feted in the same way that this image was feted, you know, when it was completed. But the difference, of course, is that those sports teams are the actual people. And this is just an image. I don't think people will be lining the streets of Manhattan to witness the parading 
of the women's national soccer team if it was just cardboard cutouts of them. Now, obviously this isn't quite the equivalent of a cardboard cutout, but it does tell us that there is this reverence for this image more as if it was the actual person, the actual Virgin Mary herself, as if she was being paraded down the streets. Now it's not definitive, but it's at least to me highly suggestive that, hmm, this is more than just an image. It's more than just a transparent conduit to the, uh, the holy figure represented. It seems to be regarded as somehow, even if this is against the theological explanation of things, it seems to be regarded as the, um, as the very manifestation of the Virgin Mary herself. Now, this happens all the time. Miracle working images, for example, I don't have these labeled here, but this is the, the Madonna um, uh, dell'Imprunata, excuse me, on the, on the left, and the Madonna di San Michele uh, in Florence. Both are in, in and around Florence. Uh, and in the 13 and 1400s, both of these images were prayed to because they were believed to perform miracles. They could perform miracles in the form of healing the sick. They could perform miracles in the form of protection, right? Divine protection, much like with Duccio's altarpiece in Siena. They could also be prayed to to ensure um, rains for crops or even to stop the rain if there's too much. Um, and the image on the left was actually brought into the city of Florence. It was on a town on the outskirts of Florence. It was actually brought into the city because it believed it needed to have that physical proximity to protect the city of Florence. Does that sound to you like people think of these images as just these inert, empty, transparent conduits to the divine? To me, not so much that, you know, I'm saying that not that people are deluded or that people are wrong to think these things, but in practice, there seems to be an understanding of images as possessing some sort of living power, some sort of living presence, that they do things, they act, they, you know, intervene into our lives in ways that we probably most, at least secular cases, seldom uh, believe. But at the same time, this idea of the living image kind of infiltrates, you know, other aspects of our culture. You know, Oscar Wilde's uh, picture of Dorian Gray about a portrait that comes to life. You know, the story of Pygmalion about a statue that comes to life, you know. And those are just taken from literature. And I understand that, you know, literature might not always be um, in concert with the reality of everyday life. But at the same time, I do encourage all of us to wonder, do we on some level believe that images contain some sort of physical presence? Even if it's not one where we expect it to result in the animation or the movement or the kind of intervention into our waking lives, but what else explains why we go to places to see images, right? When you go to the Lincoln Memorial and there's this hushed reverence for what is just simply a statue of him, you know, is it, I'm not saying that we just believe that that is Abraham Lincoln frozen in stone on that throne. I don't think any of us actually think that, at least consciously, but is there something deep down that we actually believe there is a presence there? You know, something that kind of defies the idea that an image is entirely empty. I'm sure a lot of us have heard of, um, you know, something that I think is called actually the Mona Lisa effect. Um, which actually speaks to a much larger issue, which is sort of we tend to imagine that certain images, even in secular contexts, you know, have these powers to actually move this GIF, obviously, or GIF, is it a GIF or GIF? I never got clear on this, but uh, this moving image, of course, is a joke. But I'm sure a lot of you maybe have heard this legend that, oh, the Mona Lisa is unique because if you walk across the room where it's displayed, the eyes follow you. And that's more or less the Mona Lisa effect. Um, and it's, you know, and people are captivated by this. And I don't have time to go into why the Mona Lisa is such a big deal. Um, that's for a whole other um, maybe humanity center talk at some other time. But there is this notion that we feel this compulsion to believe that there is or could be a living presence. Now, I'm going to sort of um, ruin your days a little bit that actually this idea of eyes following across the room is not exclusive to any image, much less the Mona Lisa. It's actually true of any portrait where the figure's looking outward. It's just sort of what happens when you have a three-dimensional face on a two-dimensional flat panel. That's just simply the reality. But there, yeah, I think we've all heard this though, that this painting in particular, along with its subtle presence of that half smile or frown, we almost on some level want to believe that there is a person or a spirit living inside this, at least on some level. I don't think any of us really believe this, um, but maybe on some level. 
This happens with icons even today. Um, I'm sure a lot of us at some point in our lives have flipped on the news and seen a report of, you know, an icon that seemingly by miracle begins to actually act in very human ways, usually through things, through such effects as like bleeding or crying, or in some cases, um, sweating even. Um, in fact, I remember, I just, this just occurred to me right now, um, when I was growing up outside of Detroit, um, I'm not remember where this was exactly, but I think in one of the suburbs of Detroit, there is a, um, an Orthodox church. And at some point when I was like nine or something, something like this, I think my parents were watching, they'll be able to let me know, they'll probably remember. Um, there was an icon that uh, in his Orthodox church was believed to all of a sudden have this like emanation of a, of a, of a halo around it. Now these things are investigated. I don't mean again. I don't mean to ruin anyone's days, but like in every case that I I know, these so-called bleeding icons or crying icons are revealed to be a hoax, either under the cover of night, someone applies drips of oil, or there's these uh, like sort of tubes behind the picture that kind of squirt out like red uh, red liquid, um, you know. But the fact that we seem to be very captivated by this, I think, speaks to the fact that we don't regard images very often as just empty. We, you know, I know that like, I'm not a religious person really, but like there is a kind of, I want to believe these on a certain level. Um, you know, the idea that they could somehow channel some sort of mystical power, that they could in fact act in ways that are supernatural or at least just unexpected, um, you know, kind of preserve something of the mystery that they might represent, especially for um, uh, for, for people who are, uh, you know, fact uh, practicing Christians and very, um, you know, very ardent in their faith, you know? So we've seen this kind of thing. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm stepping out of my lane here a little bit, considerably, I think. Uh, but there is this um, phenomenon called predoilia, where uh, it's like, I don't know where this happens. Again, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know where sort of in our br brain waves this occurs, but there tends to be a psychological impulse to see images of faces in objects that of course don't really have faces in them. You know, in some cases, like you can see sort of in the, this uh, uh, cut out from the internet, um, you know, we've all heard of stories of people like discovering, you know, an image of the face of Jesus or the face of the Virgin Mary in our grilled cheese, or like in this case, in a pack of Aldi potatoes, right? But even in, sec in, in secular contexts, you know, don't we often encounter everyday objects that suddenly, and without warning, read to us as faces, right? You know, a purse, you know, something in a trash bin, our coffee cup, a mop, this guy, which is like the sort of hanging mechanism on the back of a, of a, um, of a, uh, of a, of a, like a framed picture or the front of an, of a, of a Lufthansa airplane. Like, you know, what explains this? Could this be related to our desire or impulse to see images in a religious context, in a Christian context, as somehow containing a presence of a holy figure? Is this part of the same, or, you know, is this, this is the other side of the same coin, right? That we have the psychological impulse to see faces, you know, that there might be some sort of animating spirit that just like infiltrates everything, our coffee cups and what have you. It's a suggestion. I'm not saying I know for sure. Um, incidentally, I'm going to be teaching a class on this material in the fall. So um, I hope to explore this phenomenon a little bit more and maybe I can share with all of you guys. Now, the reason or the, the fact that images do, in fact, seem to be regarded in ways that they're not technically officially supposed to be has resulted in the destruction of images or what we more... Uh, uh, what we call iconoclasm. And this icon, which I began my talk with, is in fact deeply um, related to the history of iconoclasm. And the, uh, there are numerous periods of the breaking of images, the destroying of images, the belief that images were not being regarded properly and therefore they needed to be done away with. There's a number of reasons why people thought that images were being uh, regarded improperly, but one of the major ones, not the only one, but one of the major ones was because they were afraid that the people were in fact mistaking an image for a living presence and therefore praying directly to an image instead of, you know, FaceTiming with the image through your iPhone, so to speak, okay? And this destruction of images really fascinated me and other art historians and other historians of uh, religious imagery um, because it's not just the fact that images are sort of, sort of falling in and out of favor 
And not even just the mere fact that they were destroyed, but the fact that there was a spectacle being made of their destruction. And so, you know, we have the, like the whitewashing of icons of Christ, as we can see in this illustration for a, um, a, a Byzantine uh, illuminated manuscript. Um, you know, it's like this belief that they had to get rid of the images to deny the belief that people were having that the images were themselves the living presence of the holy figures. But in the act of destruction, there's ways in which that actually confirms the very thing they're trying to say that isn't true, right? Because, you know, this occurs in, in various periods in history. I'll get to this in a second. You know, this seems to be like, you know, it's not just simply the replacement of an image or the removal of an image. It's the destruction, the spectacle of it, even the violence wrought on it. There was a question that was forwarded uh, by one of you who's tuning in, um, was asking a little bit more about the Catholic or at least the Reformation um, iconoclasm that occurred in the 16th century. I'll address that very briefly right now, because there was this return of iconoclasm in the 1500s where the Protestant church was very much against the, the Catholic church's uh, use of images for much of the same reasons as what we saw in the Byzantine context where images were sort of seen as, okay, we need to sort of not have images anymore. So for example, Andreas Karlstadt, the fact that we have images in our churches is against the first commandment, thou shalt not have strange gods. That carved and painted idols should stand on altars is still more damaging and devilish. Churches are houses in which God alone should be worshipped. Artists, as the perpetrators of images, are good for nothing and understand nothing. Who can say that their images are useful? So there's this backlash against images, and for a lot of the same reasons. If people are believing that the image itself is a living thing, has the power to sort of enact miracles, are they in fact treating it as an idol and therefore distracting from the attention which should be on God and the saints alone? Not the images of them, but should be on God and the saints alone. Some of you might be more familiar with John Calvin, who of course was probably the most um, outspoken and vocal critic of a lot of the practices uh, against which the Protestants were um, were pointing their attention. He said, for they, have, for they have prostrated themselves and bent the knee before relics as before God, lighting torches and tapers as a sign of homage, putting confidence in them and running to them as if they possessed a divine power and grace. If idolatry is just to transfer the honor of God to others, can we deny that this is idolatry? And you have to admit he has a point. Right? Like, and this is the crux of it. It's okay, images are useful because they facilitate prayer, they tell the stories, but in so doing, do people still misunderstand what the images are to such a degree that it becomes, um, it, it becomes something that goes against the very tenets of the Christian faith? So for this reason, there are multiple instances of, again, the destruction of images. But I point your attention again to the fact that it's not just the removal of them, it is the destruction, ripping them down from the churches, taking them out and putting them on bonfires. Why make such a public and you know, emphatic and ultimately violent display of the destruction of images if it doesn't on some level maybe signify the fact that they believe that there's a power that needs to be killed inside of it, that they are these sort of devilish, you know, monstrosities that combine physical material with some sort of demonic presence, that they're maybe actually reaffirming the very thing that they're saying that people shouldn't believe in them. And so we're left actually with this really cool, um, provocative record of um, the destruction of images in a lot of churches in Northern Europe, in a lot of um, what are now Protestant areas of Europe. Like, for example, this is a uh, an altarpiece in Utrecht in um, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where the heads of the Virgin Mary and all the saints and holy figures have been hacked away, right? Again, the violent destruction, not just removal, but the violent destruction of images. Does this happen today? I don't know of many instances where we um, attack or um, destroy religious images anymore, maybe in some scattered occasions, but we do remove images and oftentimes we still remove them with violence. Um, I love this photograph. This is um, something that doesn't pertain to our culture today, but I think it's something we relate to. Protesters protesting against the autocratic rule of a dictator, in this case, the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos. And look, and again, this is a very provocative photograph, but the fact we have this protester just beating the crap out of this image, and it looks like 
Ferdinand Marcos is bellowing back at the protester from within the image. You know, it seems to be that we make a big show of the destruction of images. Why do we do that? It's not my place to say, oh, it's because we actually do believe that images contain the presence. But you wonder if on some level, in the same impulse we have to recognize faces where they aren't really, where they don't really appear, if there is some sense that, you know, to destroy an image is also to destroy whatever sort of power exists within it, even despite the theological justification for icons going way back to the beginning of Christianity that says, nope, it's in, it's inert, it's transparent, it doesn't actually contain presence, it's just a tool that allows you to pray. I'm wondering if examples like these or examples like these that are much closer to our own experience. Um, the removal of the statue of Saddam Hussein from, uh, I forget the name of the square, uh, in, in Baghdad um, in the early 2000s, right? It was televised. Um, there was a crowd of people. It wasn't just removed. A crane ripped it down. Closer to us, the removal of Confederate monuments uh, in various places in the, in the, in the South. Um, but again, not just the removal of them, but the destruction of them. To leave them broken and mangled and disfigured. Is that on some level an affirmation? Maybe, I'm, again, I'm not telling you this. I'm sort of suggesting, I'm wondering, and other art historians wonder the same thing. Why is it that we make a spectacle of it? Is it because, you know, obviously the Confederate statues represent in a uh, metaphorical way the sort of abhorrent ideas and abhorrent periods and aspects of, of our history but it's not just about removing them. It's like you, we have to somehow kill the image of those that perpetrated those um, those abhorrent activities. We have to leave them for dead, such as this statue, which I believe is from um, uh, the campus of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, if I'm not mistaken. It was a couple years ago when I found this, and uh, I think that's where it's from. So finally, this brings me to the last portion of my talk, the Shroud of Turin, the world's most controversial icon. Actually, no, I'm going to say it. It is the world's most controversial icon. So I'm aware that probably plenty of you know what the Shroud of Turin is, but there are many, maybe many of you who do not. So I'll just explain it very briefly. The Shroud of Turin is, or at least was at one point, the holiest artifact in all of Christianity. It was believed to be one of the cloths that was used in the preparation of Jesus Christ's body for burial. And you can see sort of the origins of the Shroud of Turin in this uh, painting here on the upper left. So the body of Christ was taken down from the cross. It's still oozing blood. It's battered. It's beaten. And there is a sheet that is wrapped underneath and then folded over the body of Jesus. My students will be very disappointed if I don't make the analogy I always do, which is it's like a quesadilla. It's folded under and over the body of Jesus Christ, much like a quesadilla. And what happened then was a miracle that that body of the dead, beaten body of Jesus Christ, then somehow transferred this miraculous image of that very same body to the sheet. And because it was folded both underneath and on top, you have then these remnant images of the front and the back of Jesus Christ's body. Now I'm showing you down here, here's a photograph of the actual Shroud of Turin. Um, and so you can see these ghostly, ethereal, um, you know, images of the body, which remind me, for example, of seeing a face in your coffee cup or a face on your purse. You know, there's got, it's not clearly there. It's like kind of hazy and amorphous and ghostly, but these hazy impressions of the front and back of Christ's body that are also punctuated by these stains of blood that supposedly transferred then from Christ's body directly into this linen sheet. This linen sheet, we call it the Shroud of Turin because it's in the city of Turin. You might be thinking, wait, Aren't you writing a book on the Shroud of Turin? Indeed, I am. That's why I'm talking about it. Um, and so this is a very provocative image, right? Um, because it is sort of, you know, the, believed to be, by believers, um, to be this sort of directly transferred, mechanically generated or miraculously generated, perhaps likeness of Jesus Christ that also contains bits and pieces of his body in the form of these stains of blood. Um, and moreover, in 1898, it was photographed for the first time. And when it was photographed for the first time, the photographer, unbeknownst of what was gonna happen, um, sort of discovered something rather peculiar about the Shroud of Turin. And that is when you take a photograph of the Shroud of Turin, and then you look at the photographic negative, all of a sudden the negative image looks more clear 
than the actual image. Here's the head portion. You can see the head looks much more three-dimensional. Um, and so again, a lot of people have gone off on these uh, tangents about, oh, the Shroud of Turin must be real because therefore it's like a primitive photograph and it, it sort of like encodes the truth of Jesus Christ's appearance and we couldn't decode it until the advent of photography and all these things. But it just kind of adds to the mystery and the aura of the Shroud of Turin and feeds into this notion that it is more than just an image for those that believe in it, of course, right? That seems to be more than just sort of this inert, powerless, transparent likeness of Jesus Christ. It seems to somehow embody him in ways that most images don't get credited with being able to do. So obviously a lot of you who do know the Shroud of Turin know it for the controversy of the fact that um, it has been scientifically tested. Uh, there's, uh, uh, in 1989, there was the, um, uh, the, uh, um, the carbon dating of the fibers of the linen sheet itself. And it was determined therefore that the, 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 that the Shroud of Turin is actually a medieval relic. It dates no earlier than the late 1200s to the 1300s. It's a medieval object. And despite this, there's still this impulse to argue for its authenticity. It's not my place to argue for against that. Like that's really sort of of no importance to me. If you wanna believe it's real, great. If you wanna believe it's fake, great. Um, but it's interesting to me, however, that even though science has weighed in and determined pretty objectively that it is not, cannot date to the time of Christ, there's still this desire to see it as real, to counteract the scientific proof, to argue away sort of the fact that, oh, maybe the, 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 the experiments, the carbon dating itself was flawed, all sorts of stuff, right? We want to believe it. The Shroud of Turin asks us to put the authenticity of religious belief on the line. And that's very um, passionate for people both for and against. Now, the Shroud of Turin, which I'm interested in, um, became the Shroud of Turin as we know it in the late 1500s and into the 1600s. It was exhibited publicly. Um, you can see, for example, here, once it arrived in the city of Turin in 1578, it drew massive crowds of pilgrims. These exhibitions of the Shroud occurred almost every year for almost a century um, and just became all of a sudden the most famous and most uh, highly regarded uh, Christian artifact in all of existence. What really interests me and what I've worked on, and I have a forthcoming book on the um, on the artistic conception of the Shroud of Turin, and one of the chapters of my book deals with like, the copies that were produced of the Shroud of Turin, um, which serve to basically kind of distribute the Shroud to places where the Shroud itself in its singular example can't go because it's one thing, it stays in Turin. But copies could be produced and therefore the, experiencing of, the experience of witnessing the Shroud can be distributed to whoever gets their hands on a copy. I'm fascinated by these things in large part because you have to trust me on this because I don't have time to explain it, but the copies themselves are also seen as in many cases just as authentic as the original shroud. Very different than our conception of copy, where we think of copy as by definition not original. But these copies very often not only repeat the appearance of the shroud to varying degrees of, of accuracy, but they also have these texts. They're inscribed with these statements that testify to their authenticity. They say that they have been extractum ex originali taurini, meaning they were extracted from the original in Turin in the year 1643 in this, in this particular case. That somehow not just copies or replicates, but it actually was been physically extracted from, much like you can have vanilla extract, a piece of vanilla that comes from the vanilla bean that can be used in cooking, right? Um, it's a really interesting way in which we conceive of, the, or they did then conceive of copies as somehow in their own right, still original, containing some sort of sacred presence that, um, again, most images in today's society, I don't think usually get that kind of, um, that kind of acknowledgement. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun doing research for that chapter. Um, I have a lot of stories with these, which you can ask me about later, but, uh, yeah, I saw a lot of these. Don't worry about this. And I finally did get to see the Shroud of Turin in person in 2010. It's the only time, in fact, it's my very first time in Turin. I've gone back a dozen times since then. Um, but my very first time in Turin was in 2010 to see one of the rare, um, though increasingly common, but still rare public exhibitions of the Shroud of Turin. Now, I will tell you, I have a very secular relationship to the Shroud of Turin. That's all I'll say about it. Despite that, it is the single most charismatic object I've ever seen in my life. I was not prepared for how striking 
seeing it was. Now, part of it is like, I've always been fascinated with it. So it's like seeing something I've always wanted to see going back to childhood, but I was not prepared for just how captivating of an experience just looking at it is. And I can't explain it. I can't explain the kind of um, hold it had over me, even from a secular point of view. I can't explain sort of why and sort of how I could not have predicted that, but it is the single most captivating thing I've ever seen. And I'm going to end then sort of with sort of how in the age of increasingly virtual experiences, how these objects, these images, which in many cases we might on some level believe to be themselves physically real, how does that convey in a virtual platform? Back in April, I published an article at Slate um, on the occasion of a virtual online exhibition of the Shroud of Turin put on by the uh, the Archdiocese of Turin and the cathedral around Easter time of, of, of 2020. So right, you know, after the pandemic has started. And it's really fascinating to me that there was this broadcasted exhibition of the Shroud of Turin. What does that tell us? You know, because in theory, you know, seeing it live on Facebook or seeing it live on YouTube shouldn't be any different than just looking at a photograph of it. And yet, there is this whole hullabaloo about this exhibition. What does it mean? What does it tell us about what we believe in the image that somehow some power can even penetrate through our computer screens in a live, you know, it makes a difference for some people apparently to see a camera panning over it live and broadcast on the internet versus just looking at a photograph that could have been taken any number of years ago. And so to me, this tells me something about the enduring legacy of icons, even today, in the pandemic, when we are increasingly distanced from each other and from things, there's something about images that seems to sort of trans, uh, trans, transcend those distancing effects that we all experience today. And so I think I'm basically out of time and I'm done anyway. So thank you everybody. I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're gonna have a moderator jump back into things and take over, is that what's happening? Do I need to stop sharing my slides? Thank you, Dr. Casper. That was awesome and really interesting. Um, so we have several questions that have come in and I'm gonna do my best because some of them are really lengthy, big fat questions. So let's see what we can do to answer some of those. And I, I think I'm gonna start with a couple of the less complex ones first. Um, Let's see, uh, what inspired your field of study with icons and what's been your most fascinating sort of aha discovery? Yeah, so I've been interested in icons um, even before I knew I was interested in icons. Um, and really the Shroud of Turin is what did it for me. Um, I first became aware of the Shroud of Turin when I was like nine years old. Um, and I grew up in a Protestant household. So, um, you know, even at that point when there was more sort of a religious sort of, you know, aspect to my, to my life, it wasn't something that was emphasized like in the churches that I went to, you know, Protestants have a very different relationship to, to, to images and Catholics. Um, but it's fascinating just by the idea of this thing that could be seen as an authentic remnant of, you know, of, of, of Jesus Christ. And so I became fascinated around the time it was carbon dated. And I was just blown away. Just again, the fact that it was, it, it was revealed that it's a medieval object, it's not an authentic relic from the time of Christ, um, didn't actually, um, you know, uh, extinguish my enthusiasm for that. It's just such a fascinating object. And so I've carried this fascination all through. And then in graduate school, um, you know, I kind of became more and more interested in religious images generally, icons specifically. Um, I then uh, actually did my dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania on um, El Greco, who I showed very briefly at the beginning of my talk, um, who was an icon painter in Greece before he goes to Spain where I wrote my dissertation and first book. And then he goes off to Spain, or sorry, go sorry, Greece, and goes to Italy, where I wrote my first uh, book on El Greco's Italian period. And then he goes to Spain, um, but he began as an icon painter. And I was curious, like, well, in what way did he, did he or did he not ever stop painting icons? Um, and then finally, all the while, I wanted to work on the Shroud of Turin. But once my El Greco book was out of the way, I could finally start uh, doing actual real research on the Shroud of Turin. And my research is focused on its status as a religious image in the 1500s and 1600s. The modern debates about authenticity play no role whatsoever in my thinking about it or in my work about it. Um, but it was just, it also exploded onto the scene um, as this really peculiar object, 
even in the 15 and 1600s that had not been talked about by art historians. Art historians have ignored for the most part, um, with some notable exceptions, but for the most part, have kind of ignored the Shroud of Turin because it's not a work of art. And yet it was conceived in that period as a divine painting, like God painted it with a paintbrush with Christ's blood as the pigment. And so just that it opened up this world uh, relevant to my own field of art history, even though it itself is not a conventional work of art. And so I've been working on it now for 10 years. My book's coming out in September and hopefully you guys can buy it. I'll get the royalties. It'll be great. <laughs> Go buy the book, right? Absolutely. Um, so after the, your book comes out, what's your next project? Um, and, you know, do you have any plans to work on whatever a dream project might be to research? Well, as sad as it is, The Shroud was a dream project. So <laughs> I think I peaked early and now I'm on my decline. <laughs> I thought you might yeah. say that. Yeah, no, I don't really know. I have some ideas for projects that may or may not become big enough to be a third book. I don't know if I have a third book in me, like two is plenty in a lot of ways. Um, but um, yeah, I don't really know. And and I, in some regard, it will, in it, well, I have some ideas and they are icon related, but they're not formed enough yet for me to be able to say anything about them yet. So in due time. I, I gotcha. We'll see what happens. We'll, we'll yeah. stay tuned. Um, interesting question here. How is your work specifically funded? Yeah, great question. So um, like any scholar in any field, um, and I'm speaking from the field of the humanities, and I think a lot of people associate like outside funding and like, you know, research funds as being the domain of the sciences. Um, but it's not. I get my funding for my research um, from some internal like Miami University sources, but those alone could not possibly fund what I need to do. It involves a lot of travel, a lot of time spent, um, you know, in Italy, working in archives, doing research. Um, so I apply to grants. Um, I've received funding from the National Endowment of the Humanities. I've received funding from the American Philosophical Association, or sorry, American Philosophical Society. Um, a couple of others I'm just forgetting about right now, um, but they're competitive. And, you know, but I need to have somebody, you know, pay for me to be able to go off and do the research because you have to go somewhere um, to be able to pay in some cases for just the in incidental cost of publishing, which sometimes otherwise might have to come out of my own pocket. Like publishing books is expensive. In art history, our books cost, could cost a press like thousands of dollars to produce because the images are really high quality. They need to use really special paper. I have to you, I have to arrange for copyright clearances for images that are not in the public domain. And, you know, my two books now on average between them cost about five to seven grand. Um, but I've been able to get grants to cover the cost of them just to distribute my ideas and to get them published and out there. Um, and so I apply all the time for grants. Now, our grants aren't like the multi-million dollar grants that someone in the sciences might have. because I'm not running a lab, you know, or anything like that. Um, but still, you know, I need to be able to fund um, the ability to work on things. I had a year off um, research leave in 2019 that was, um, granted by Miami University, but I had to have my salary paid by an outside source. And I got a really prestigious fellowship through Brown University that um, allowed me that full year off so I could complete my book on the Shroud of Turin. Without that, it would take me many, many more years to be able to complete it while I'm teaching and, and so on. So yeah, so we apply for grants from the outside, you know, big and small, um, but uh, they're kind of essential for, um, for research because my research doesn't occur here in a lab. My research involves going to Italy, going to the archives and having to spend significant time there. Excellent, that's a great answer. So many little details about what goes into a book that you know I think most readers don't really consider or think about and um, how expensive that might be. So on the topic of books, um, besides your own, um, are there any books that you might recommend on this topic for somebody who wants to read a little bit farther? Um, yeah, there are a lot of great books that engage the ideas generally in, the various, in various ways uh, that I've talked about here in my talk. I mean, there's lots and lots of books by serious scholars on Byzantine icons. Um, there's a scholar named Charles Barber who was at Notre Dame. I'm trying to think where he is now. Um, but anyway, um, but he's a major scholar of Byzantine art. He wrote um, he wrote a book, uh, that was the name I'm actually forgetting at the moment, which is a, 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 a terrible disservice to Charles Barber, but uh, um, but he had a book that's like one of the foundational um, 
uh, sort of books on Byzantine icons, but there's been dozens of them. I mean, icons for art history, art historians are pretty central. Okay. Now my wide angle view of icons where I include not just medieval Byzantine icons, but just sort of the power of images generally, I can attribute a lot of that to a book uh, that's foundational for the way that I practice art history um, by a scholar named David Friedberg. It's a book called The Power of Images, which is kind of a, a title that suggests it's sort of very, very sweeping. It is sweeping, but it's a work of serious scholarship, but totally different from art history scholarship because it kind of goes back and forth between, well, here's religious images in the medieval and early modern period, but what about images in our own contemporary present? Do we think of them the same way? And so actually that picture I showed of the protester beating um, that image of uh, Ferdinand Marcos, um, that actually came from David Friedberg's book, The Power of Images. For me, that is a foundational text that I constantly refer to and rely on. In terms of the Shroud of Turin, it's a complicated question. Um, if you want books written by people that are, feel very strongly about whether it's real or not, there's too many to mention. There's a lot of pseudoscience, I will say, on both sides. Um, in terms of scholarly books on the Shroud of Turin, there's a really, really great one that just came out in English translation, so I can share it with you. Um, there's a friend of mine uh, uh, at the University of Turin, Nicolo, uh, uh, Andrea Nicolotti. And Andrea Nicolotti wrote this groundbreaking book encyclopedic on the sort of documentary history of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, first published in Italy in Italian, but it just came out this past year in English translation by Baylor University Press. And it's believe, I believe it's just simply called The Shroud. Um, uh, the story of a controversial relic, uh, something like that, um, but Andrea Nicolotti. And it's sort of the one-stop shopping for like serious scholarly um, sort of resources on the Shroud of Turin. Um, and then there's others around as well, but there's, there's a huge bibliography for the Shroud of Turin that you kind of like, if you want to find something in the Shroud, crazy or not crazy, you'll find something that suits your interest. Excellent. All right. Um, so we're really getting into um, some meteor questions and we are um, sort of running down on time. So just to let everyone know and to be mindful of your time, I want to remind the audience that you can view this webinar in its entirety later this afternoon um, if you need to leave us before we've concluded today. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and move forward with a couple more questions. See if can we can say, I'm also happy to stay for a few minutes longer. If I've, if, if Excellent. And perhaps we can also forward you some of these questions if you sure. want to uh, communicate directly with with some of the the question askers especially if it leads to future funding <laughs> and there are some really really good as i mentioned significant questions here so sure. um, you know they may also be better more deeply explained in actual writing because they're they're good questions um so this one is from caroline um she first says hello so good hey caroline you. caroline got it i know you <laughs> um she says why do you think most people don't see icons in the same way these days such that is in, as in living objects and is the reason for this change religious um and increasingly secularization artistic technological aesthetic um, you know, the invention of photography, moving image, a little of both. Can you comment? Yeah, I think all of those things. And I think generally I would say it's a, uh, I think it kind of, uh, I'll say it kind of unfortunate, but uh, a distrust nonetheless of, um, of superstition. Um, you know, we place such a high premium on like objective facts. And so we just rationally sort of concluded, I mean, I'm speaking in the most broad terms. I can't speak to any individual, obviously, but we as a society, since the enlightenment, um, we trust science and science kind of says that, you know, things are more knowable than not knowable. And um, we, I think we've lost a little bit sort of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, like the authority of folklore or the authority of um, myth and the authority, like those things tend to be sort of regarded or sort of relegated to sort of a lower level of knowledge. And we tend to favor sort of like the rational, the scientifically objective. Um, and also with that comes, I think, increased secularization. I don't have hard numbers, but I think it doesn't take that much of an imagination to realize that there are, you know, there have been far fewer adherence to Christianity in, you know, recent decades and recent centuries than there were in the medieval period or the, or the Renaissance period. Um, I think with that comes, you know, people are less likely to believe in the mystical. 
Um, there's still plenty of you out there, okay? Um, but generally speaking, you know, we tend to sort of downplay, or sometimes we feel ashamed. And that's one of the things that uh, that um, David Friedberg says in his book, the, the, the Power of image, Images. We're kind of trained to sort of like, just like, oh, that's silly to think that I have a kind of response to an image that might like, affirm a belief in it that I rationally can't believe is actually there. You know, we kind of, you know, we treat that as child's, um, you know, a way that a child thinks or something that's uncouth or maybe something of a primitive society, you know? Um, so I think everything that Caroline said is, is absolutely sort of the reason why. Excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, let's see. This question comes from Sam. Um, have you observed different relationships to non-religious images, political images, magazine covers, advertising, in countries where icon veneration is common? And he also says, thank you so much for your presentation. Oh man, that is a phenomenal question. That's a really good question. And I can, and I, I haven't. Um, you know, I will say that, and this is a little bit of a stereotype, but you know, I've spent, expensive expensive well, expensive and extensive time in italy and um you know italy is i think again I, i'm being very cautious here because i'm speaking in the most general terms um i think italian society is a little bit more accepting of um superstitious belief and i don't mean that superstitious in a pejorative sense i don't mean that in this case um but I don't know that I've witnessed that therefore they just believe in images, um, you know, they believe in a power of images more than we do by comparison. It's a great question. That's a really, really great question that I should probably write down and that could be my third book that hopefully, <laughs> hopefully Sam will pay for. Yeah. All right. I hope you're listening to that, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And as I mentioned, some of these are um, really complex questions that I'm, I hardly even know if I could get through, let alone you could really answer um, in a, a succinct amount of time. Let's see. Um, here's one from Mark. He says, the Shroud of Turin reminds us that icons and images are also defended by John and Damascus and others through incarnational arguments. Would you say that early defenses of images on the grounds that Christ was a corporal image of God complicate the idea that in the medieval period, there was a clear division between popular and theological understandings of religious icons? Whew. Yeah. Mark must be a scholar. That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Same. Well, Mark, you know, it's, it, you know, th that is actually the one thing I left out. Um, you know, I was focusing so much on sort of the, uh, the complicated ways in which images could be seen as dangerous and, but because they could be seen as idols, you know, but the other thing that's involved in both the being in favor of images and also being against images is the question, can you properly portray Christ's huma human and divine essences together in an image? And so besides the whole fear of idolatry, one of the other arguments against images in Byzantine times, as well as in during the Reformation iconoclastic times, um, is simply that, well, images can't actually portray God's dual humanity and divinity, or Christ's dual hu uh, humanity and, and, and divinity. And so you shouldn't have them. Like, it's just, it simplifies Jesus in a way that uh, misrepresents um, who he is. And yes, for sure with the Shroud of Turin, that idea of, you know, the... Um, uh, of the uh, uh, of the incarnation is central. I talk about this in my book uh, forthcoming that all of you will purchase. Um, the incarnational metaphors are more um, present with the Shroud of Turin because it isn't just an image. It is for believers also a relic of the body of Christ because it has his blood. That's very different than most other icons, which are just images that don't actually contain any physical remnants, any physical stuff of the um, of, of Jesus. But the Shroud of Turin is like one, the only, well, one of the only examples where one can venerate an image while at the same time venerate the physical presence. Even in, even in a fragmented form, traces of blood can still be regarded as the physical presence of Jesus Christ. And so um, I don't know if this really answers your question, Mark, because it actually like you you kind of answer your own question there. You're absolutely right. It does complicate things. And that's a, such a huge issue as well. The sort of incarnational theologies of images um, is a, uh, uh, is certainly there. I, I see there's a notation there. Charles Barber's book is called Figure and Likeness. And I, I'm, if I remember correctly, he talks about this as well in there. So it, it, it is it is uh, an issue that's, I edited out for clarification, but it's absolutely there. So good catch, Mark. That was definitely a good question, Mark. 
Um, okay, so this one comes from Anne um, and is somewhat more manageable. Um, she says, it occurs to me that another prohibition to idol worship in the Bible occurs in 1 Corinthians 8, which discusses whether eating food sacrificed to idols is permissible or not. Yeah. Would you care to comment on how idols in the Greco-Roman context, which were polytheistic, influenced Christian iconography or iconoclasm? Yeah, it influenced both. Um, you know, certainly the earliest Christian images derive from um, from ancient images. Um, you know, people are sometimes surprised to see that the first images of Jesus Christ, he looks like Apollo. Um, he's not bearded. He is youthful. He is athletic. Um, and it's because they're early Christian. And I'm talking like the third and fourth century, um, because you know Christianity was mostly an underground religion until it was officially uh, 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 permissible, uh, made permissible by Emperor Constantine in the uh, in the fourth century CE. So you know Christ has been dead for three centuries. The earliest Christian images that are sort of around sort of the third th fourth century, um, but they're drawing from what is you know what is typical of images, and that is imperial images of emperors and Julius Caesar. And, um, you know, the kind of Greco-Roman ways of portraying um, idealized um, gods and emperors and so forth. And so you see that, um, you know, in the earliest Christian images. Now, in terms of the practices that you're talking about, about leaving offerings, uh, the uh, eating of offerings to, 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 uh, to, to ancient gods is also really relevant, which I'll explain in a second. But like those practices, like, of course, when people come converted to this newfangled Christian religion, if they were practicing those pagan religions before, they in many cases are carrying over those practices. And so that itself kind of led to sort of the kind of iconoclastic nervousness about like, wait, are people really regarding images the way they're supposed to? Because if you're giving offerings to an image, it's way too easy to think that you're giving offering to the actual manifestation of the God um, and not just the empty transparent. And again, the iPhone that brings you in communication with, with, uh, with the God. Um, so yeah, that definitely influenced both the practice of images, what they look like, and also the prohibition against images and iconoclasm. Now you mentioned eating. There's actually a really great article by, um, by a scholar who I admire greatly, um, who's a medievalist. I'm not a medievalist, so I don't know the, the, the field as much as, as others would, um, but a really great article about sort of the actual like practice of eating icons, uh, that they would often be ground up and sort of like made into like a slurry and then, you know, like a milkshake at McDonald's or something, you, you eat it, you consume it. Because the idea again, is that like somehow there's a, there's a material presence of divine, of divinity that if you consume bits and pieces of an icon, you're actually taking medicine that can have a physical restorative effect on your body. Um, that also seems to be kind of like, does that go against the violation? Or does, does that go against the theology of images as somehow being empty and inert? It seems like it might. So those kinds of practices, again, I think are absolutely at the heart of why there were these controversies that did result in periodic instances of destroying images because people maybe were not thinking about them in the way they should. Good answer. Excellent. So I am going to probably cut it off there because these are um, some really, really, um, in-depth questions. I'm going to forward these and make sure you have them so you can respond right. to them thoughtfully and um, give them the attention they deserve. So we um, are out of time for the day and we certainly appreciate you being here, Dr. Casper, and for leading this uh, webinar today. As a reminder, the recording of this presentation will be available on our website later. Um, and again, if you wish to learn more about the important work of the Humanities Center at Miami, please go to www.humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. Um, and to donate and become a friend of humanities, uh, please go to give to miamioh.org slash humanities center. Again, thank you, Dr. Casper. These were excellent answers to some um, some really big questions. And, you know, we're really lucky to have you and your willingness to reach out to some of these folks with some of the, the bigger questions because, you um, I know these are important. So again, we thank you so much. We thank you for joining us today and love and honor to everyone. Have thank you. Day. Thank you.